Here we are, it's the last day of uh, Northwest Trudeau, and we're going to get things started. Uh, of course, first thing in the morning, it's time for some announcements. So, just a few things. If you have uh, been one of our presenters uh, during the conference, first, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, however, if you want to pick up your program evaluations, you're welcome to do so this evening at the, uh, uh, well, at the closing banquet. So we can, uh, and if you aren't going to be able to be at the closing banquet, let us know. We can get those as well to a colleague or have them sent to you. So just let us know. But tonight at the closing banquet, we'll be able to, to, to get those program evaluations. We have some, inter or some individuals that won items from Exhibitor Bingo that still need to pick up those items, and they can do so at Pringle Creek. And that's uh, Corey Ray, Liz Trainer, Jared Payton, and Sarah Portsey. So go get your items or I'm taking them home with me. No big deal. Um, we have this afternoon guidebook, or this afternoon we have our round tables that are scheduled. Those have been updated in guidebook. So if you're not using guidebook, you can pick up a, just a small sheet with the topics and locations at the uh, table just outside of uh, uh, the exhibition hall here. Uh, I'm not sure if those are there yet, but they will be shortly. Uh, so if you want to get more information on those, that's where you'll find it. Uh, and finally, in terms of an announcements, a reminder, today over lunch is our business meeting. And so if, uh, well not if, we like to encourage everyone to sit with new people and make new friends during the conference. However, during the business meeting, we really need you to be institutionally oriented because we'll be voting and doing some different items as part of business meeting. So make sure today at lunch that you're sitting with the other people from your institution. Um, yeah, actually, well, and one final announcement. Um, today, uh, for the first time, we're going to be streaming a number of our sessions. And actually, the first session we'll be streaming is going to be our featured speaker, Larry Roper, who's going to be coming up in about five minutes here. Um, and so this is new technology for us. We're, we're not quite sure how it's all going to work out, but uh, we are very excited about this. And we're hoping that all of you can help us with that. Um, it can get kind of loud in here. And so if you could help us keep down some of the ambient noises, if you're going to be in here during any of our sessions that are streamed, we would really appreciate it. We just want to make sure that people that are joining us remotely are able to hear all the great things that our speakers are able to say. So. Um, yeah, I think that's that. At this point, I'd love to have Rich Shields come up and talk a little bit about the foundation. I want to thank everyone who's already given. Uh, we will be uh, today at the second afternoon break. We'll be finalizing the uh, basket, so make sure to stop by and, and put your uh, uh, bid in for the, the basket. Um, also, we will uh, this evening be announcing the raffles prizes, and again, uh, you can purchase the raffle ticket for $5. All that money goes directly to the foundation. And we actually have had three anonymous individuals come forward to say that for every person that gives at least $5, they will put a dollar in. So if you make a pledge of $5, there, you will actually be making a pledge for $8 because of those three individuals. Uh, we want to encourage the, the spirit of giving and, and for the foundation so that we can continue the excellent work that we do as for the association. And so we encourage you to continue thinking about that. And we'll be sitting at the table outside, and we can definitely appreciate your help. I also know that the executive board for Northwest School oftentimes don't want to take credit because this, this isn't their banquet. But I would like to also recognize our executive committee for all the work that they've done uh, for the association and for making this a great conference for us. So thank you. <laughs> So uh, every year we get to visit a new community and uh, call it home for a few days. And in the past, one of the things that we have done is for those that are presenting during the conference, we give, have given them a, a small gift as an appreciation. 
And we decided uh, that a better way to do that would be to uh, leave a little bit of a mark on the community. And instead of giving our presenters a gift, making a donation to a local organization on their behalf. Um, this year, we are, uh, the, the organization that we're recognizing is the Center for Hope and Safety. And we're very lucky to have Jane Downing, who's their director here today, tell us a little bit about uh, the great work that they're doing to save the community. We'll give her a hand. Um, Um, I feel honored to be here. I am a Willamette alum, so it's even more exciting for me to have um, folks that um, meant so much to me and still do in many ways be a part of this gathering. And in, I love that you're recognizing the fact that um, folks in the local community really could use some support, and so I appreciate that very much. The Center for Hope and Safety actually began over 40 years ago, providing services to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. Last year, we had over 20,000 contacts to our program. And we're a small program. We have um, actually less than 14 staff members, 13.7 um, FTE, providing all of those services with volunteers. And many of those volunteers come from Willamette University, uh, Chemeckna Community College, many other um, institutions in our community which have students who volunteer and make a difference for those survivors. We actually offer a 24-hour crisis line in English and Spanish, and we also use the language line so we can talk to folks in 140 different languages. We have a safe shelter that operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And our shelter is very different than other shelters you may have heard of. Sometimes folks think of institutions with all the beds lined up. We try to make our shelter a home. And um, when folks come in, they're often surprised by how home, what kind of home atmosphere it is. And I think that's really um, important for you all because you're doing one of the most fundamental things for folks. And you think about the students you work with and how important their housing is to them. And think about victims of violence fleeing for their lives and that, that coming into a place that feels like home for them is so incredibly important. We also have support groups. We offer them in English and Spanish. We have all of our educational materials translated into English, Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese, Chinese, large print, audio, and braille. And the reason for that is we know that language can be an incredible barrier for folks reaching out and getting help and support. And we want to reduce those barriers as much as possible. And I think today we're kind of kindred spirits in that. You're re reducing barriers for individuals. You're making it possible for them to be able to focus on what they need to do. And that's what we do. And so it's even, even more meaningful for me today to say thank you that you're, that you're making a donation to make sure that folks have some of those fundamental pieces that are so critical for them. And we will continue to keep providing that support, and we couldn't do what we do without folks like you who care and make a difference for us. So thank you all very much. So again, Jane, thank you so much for the work that you and your staff do uh, to support the Salem community. Uh, so on behalf of Northwest Akuo and all of our presenters, uh, we have a check for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, well, we're going to uh, be jumping into our uh, featured speaker this morning. Uh, we're very excited, as I said earlier, to be uh, joined by a number of our colleagues from around the region online. And uh, for those that are joining us online, uh, you're able to uh, ask questions on, in the right hand uh, corner, uh, bottom corner of your screen, there's a chat dialog box. So feel free to ask a question, and one of our moderators in the room can ask that to Larry if you have anything that comes up. Um, and with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Pamela, who's going to do our introduction for future speaker. Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Pamela Seitz, and I'm a first-year CSSA student with Oregon State University, and I'm a resident director there. It is my pleasure to introduce this morning's speaker and my advisor, Dr. Larry Roper. Larry is a professor at the School of Language, 
Culture and Society, and coordinator of the Social Justice Studies Program at Oregon State University. Previously, he served as our Vice Provost for Student Affairs from 1995 to 2014. He also served as Interim Dean to the College of Liberal Arts. His, he has degrees from um, Heidelberg University, Bowling Green State University, and the University of Maryland. He has held numerous positions in student affairs, including Director of Housing, Coordinator of Multicultural Affairs, Associate Dean of Students, and Vice President of Student Affairs, Dean of Students. Larry currently serves as the Commissioner with the State of Oregon's Higher Education Coordinating Commission, Chair of NASPA's Faculty Fellowship, President of the Jackson Street Youth Shelter, and on the Education Committee of Oregon, um, Community Foundation. He served a four-year four term as the editor of the NASPA Journal and six years as, the, as a commissioner with the Northwest Commission of Colleges and Universities. Larry has more than 50 publications in the form of book chapters, uh, journal articles, magazine articles, book reviews, and monographs. He's a co-editor of the books Teaching for Change, the Difference, Power, and the Discrimination Model, and Supporting and Supervising Middle-Level Professionals, Charting the Path to Success. He has also served on more than 65 thesis and dissertation committees, having chaired more than 25. You can follow Larry on Twitter at, at Larry Roper. In loom of honorarium, Larry has asked that Northwest Akuho donates to, um, in his name to Jackson Street Youth Shelter in Corvallis. Larry's presentation today is entitled um, Ensuring Relevance During Higher Education Reinvention. Let's extend a warm welcome um, to Larry Roper. Back on track. Thanks for making me sound old. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I am. So, um, well, good morning. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I hope that I'm able to do um, in the end is I really I want to talk a little bit about the current conversation that's going on about higher education. Um, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really messy um, conversation. Uh, but it's a conversation that I think has relevance for, for everybody in the room. But I hope that in the end that I can get back to the point that, um, that Jane made most eloquently when she was here, uh, which is um, that in the end it's about lives. Um, and, and that our work is about, is about lives and it's about the impact that we have on others. Um, but in somewhere that that's really gotten lost right now in the current, in the current discourse on, on higher education. And so what I want to do is just spend a little time talking about the, the conversation that at least I'm trying to track um, and trying to engage in as a, as a member of our um, state higher education coordinating commission where we're, we have the responsibility for our seven um, state universities and our 17 community colleges in the state in terms of trying to figure out how to most best support those institutions and to help to what we call both steer them and cheer for them. <laughs> Um, as we try to try to navigate the future, uh, but the conversation actually goes beyond um, um, beyond the borders of the U.S. I mean, this really is a, a global conversation um, as you go to other countries around. So, what is the nature of higher education? How do we measure quality? And how do we measure success? And how do we deal with some of the the public need um, for certain issues in relationship to that? You know, as Sam was said, I, I served in, um, as director of housing at one point, but that was after um, living in residence halls for seven years. <laughs> um, so I, um, and I always told people the one job that I always felt like I could always do was living. Um, I, 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 just, I just loved, uh, I loved that experience. Um, and I feel like that for me was probably the most formative um, phase of my, of my professional life, just because of the, the engagement um, that it required. Um, but also just the, the intensity of the relationship and the conversations and, and the way that it helped me to really hone in on what it really meant to me as an, an educator. Um, and so what I want to do um, is to try to talk about what's, what's I see happening in higher education 
right now and how that um, has particular import um, for, for, for those in, in housing um, uh, and working in, in residence halls. And so the, the Dave and Eric maybe have a title. I mean, Dave and um, Eric, yeah, required that I have a title for this. And so it's about sort of ensuring, um, trying to ensure our relevance as higher education is reinvented. And I'm not sure that it's necessarily being reinvented as opposed to being disrupted and then put back together in some other form. Um, but, um, but there's a, a, a real um, sort of freneticness to it. And so when I look at sort of what's happening right now, there's sort of some challenges that I see in our, in our present landscape. Um, one is that I think if you look at, uh, particularly for public universities, the environmental turbulence that we're facing right now in terms of just funding, um, the public questions about, about higher education, um, the cause for reform. In fact, the people who are putting significant amounts of money into trying to stimulate reform. I mean, Bill Gates, uh, among them, are trying to find these new ways to try to, to stimulate um, changes in higher education. Uh, the Lumina Foundation um, also being prominent among those. Um, questions about the value of higher education. You know, the people ask the question, is higher education worth it? Uh, and, and then in some cases, people are coming out very loudly and saying no, that higher education isn't worth it. And what they're saying is, is, is there a, a value proposition in higher education? So is what we're asking people to invest in higher education worth what they see as the return? Um, and in fact, if they've sort of commoditized it, that is it worth it for the jobs that people are getting or the jobs that people are not getting? So it's a, almost as if higher education is, a, is now a transactional um, relationship. You know, you get an education and you get a job. And if you don't get a job, then education hasn't been worth it. Um, and as a, as a father of a senior in high school, I'm fighting the urge to enter that conversation. Right? You know, I had the luxury of going to a small liberal arts college. Um, and uh, I was a history major. And you know, there are questions people are asking now, well, why would somebody major in philosophy? Or why would somebody major in history? Well, my son was major in philosophy. So the typical question would be like, so what job are you gonna get with that? You know, are they hiring philosophers? <coughs> but that that but that is the question. Those are the kinds of questions that we're facing in our education around why would you major in something that doesn't automatically lead to a job and so is that intellectualism versus careerism. Um, conversation that, um, that we're in the midst of. Um, and so there's lots of scrutiny. Um, there's lots of, uh, of, of intensity in terms of the, um, the accountability. And then there's concern about so sort of what is the core business of higher education um, and what are mission critical activities. And this is where the question around housing will come in. We'll talk about that later uh, because we will ask the question if. Should the unit college university be in the business of housing people? Is that a legitimate business or should that reside somewhere else? And so if you just follow the images in higher education, you know, you look at places like California or other places where, where students are expressing concerns about cost and access and equity. Um, recently, even just last week, you know, the, the governor in Wisconsin. Uh, wanted to sort of shift from uh, the University of Wisconsin system to a public service mission. Um, and eventually relented and said that it was actually an editing error. But I think that what it is, is really is sort of that question about sort of what is the, the, what are relevant missions for higher education? Should they really be about trying to, to liberalize people, not liberalize in a, in an edu in a, in a political sense? liberalizing in terms of people's thinking and people's values and, and people's ability to, um, to navigate the, the nuances and the complexities of, of the world. Those are part of the conversation and have to deal with the issue around quality. You know, how do we measure quality and how do we how do we measure outcomes? 
And so this is where we this is where we enter um, the conversation because while there's lots of confusion right now, I believe that there's tremendous promise for the future of higher education. But I think in order for us to capture the future, for anybody who's in a contentious environment to capture, capture the promise, you have to figure out so sort of how do we enter the conversation and how do we manage um, the difficulty of the conversation. And so I believe that this is a time when we actually have the ability to bring a new and unimagined value to higher education. And hopefully I'll offer some, some suggestions or some thoughts around how we can do that a little bit later. Um, we have an opportunity to reimagine, to reinvent, and recreate not just our, our programs and our services, but ourselves as professionals. I think it will require a unique kind of professional to be successful on the emerging landscape of higher education. And it's not someone who's combative or someone who, who's, who's defensive, but it's someone who honors um, the significance of the questions that are being asked. These are legitimate questions. They're good questions um, that anyone should ask for the level of investment that we're asking people to make in higher education. About what is the value that I will get for literally, the, for some cases, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that I'm being asked, or the debt burden that I will carry with me. What value will I, will I carry with me? Um, so we've got to legitimately engage those questions and, and, and help them to answer those. And then I think there's opportunities for, for new clarity and, and growth. Um, it's a chance for us to grow as professionals. It's a chance for us to add clarity to, to who we are, um, why we're here, to why our institutions need us, and then what we can get done, what we can produce of value um, for our institution. And so what I want to do is to just share what I think are sort of five major and dynamics that are facing higher education and certainly won't be able to go into the, the kind of depth um, that, um, that issues of this magnitude require. Um, but I think these are sort of the kinds of things that are um, the, sort of part of the, the, the major shifts and change and agenda in, in higher education. I know Erica said something about questions and um, you know, small enough group that people have questions anytime along the way feel free um, to, to jump in with them and, and we can and find ways to integrate those into the, the presentation and conversation. And so the five areas are a globalization, mass demand, and I'm gonna spend some time on each of these. The mass demand for higher education, achievement gap, um, technologies, and then economic fluctuations. Um, and so these are five major drivers on the higher education um, landscape. And so when we think about um, globalization, um, we think about sort of higher education as a global enterprise. That all over the world, people are engaging in, in, in higher education. And what we're seeing is that because of these increasingly integrated um, economies across nations, that people are fluidly moving among systems of higher education. In ways that are un, in, in ways and in, in numbers that are unprecedented. And so when you go to, to Europe and you look at them trying to identify ways that people that education can be portal among countries and people and through the Bologna Agreement and their ability to be able to, to shift from one university to the other, they're really talking about a system of higher education that has these permeable, permeable boundaries. You think about sort of the linkages that we have among scholars just through the use of technology and their ability to collaborate and to work. You know, higher education has become, the higher education community has become much smaller. And we know that millions of students and scholars move across the globe and around the world to campuses in order to learn and to teach and to research and to disseminate knowledge and culture. Well, we have an ability, and particularly as residence halls, have an ability to be a part of that global, that globalization um, as we attract students from around the world, um, as we house um, students um, from around the world in these uh, incredible and rich mixes and arrays of uh, students to be able to, to model what does it really mean to be a global community? 
and what does it mean for a campus to be a global campus? We, in our last, um, my last year at OSU, I served on a, um, a globalization task force with an idea for us to try to figure out what our global agenda was in terms of globalizing, uh, bringing the world to OSU and increasing OSU's impact on the world. Well, I think again, many institutions are talking about the reach of their the reach of their missions, and they're looking at the reach of those missions far beyond what historically might have been the way the institutions describe themselves. I know um, last summer I was in I was in London, and I read a paper. I was amazed to read a paper about their concern about the out migration of their best students um, to private institutions in the U.S. And their concern was the reason that the students were choosing U.S. institutions was because of the holistic nature of OSU of, of, the, of the U.S. education, right? The students would go there and they were they would be they were treated as whole people, and there was an array of programs and services and co-curricular experiences. Well, those are the very things that are now being challenged in this country because they know this. <laughs> And so they were talking about in English institutions about how to transform their institutions to model after the, the greatest attractions in U.S. institutions, which is that people are not just singularly popular. That education is more than just about the intellectual um, development of, of, of people, but it's about imparting other life and, and social um, and community and um, international citizenship skills. And so globalization is a, is a really important issue for us to, to think about. Um, the demand for higher education. Um, and again, we, we know that a lot of the, the demand was driven by the, um, the shift from a post-industrial to a knowledge-driven economy. Um, that, that the economy that we have now is you know, much less manufacturing and requires many more um, technical um, skills than, than has been the case historically. Um, and then this growth has really sort of spurred that demand again around the world in terms of, of educational access. Um, enrollment has expanded all over the world. Um, and again, because of the, the changes in life expectancies, um, we have more students throughout the lifespan who are accessing higher education. You know, in my role as vice provost, one of the uh, joys that I had was at our annual commencement ceremony, I got to be the, the profile of the graduating class. And um, the thing that would always get the biggest applause um, was when I would read the ages of the youngest um, and the oldest graduate. Hmm. And so most years it'd be somebody graduating who was 16, and then someone graduating who was 74. And so we know that, that folks are, because of the shifts in education, that people are entering higher education, in some cases at an earlier age of getting access to higher education credit and experiences um, at an earlier age. Um, and they're, um, they're coming back and returning to education at more advanced ages. And so the, the, the shifts in terms of the demand for higher education means that we've got to have this ability to think about, so what role do we play in the lifespan education of students? And I think that's a really important question for, um, for Harvard to think about, so what is, this, what is about this notion of a multi-generational campus and how does that translate to a residence hall and environment or the services and programs that may be offered? through a housing program. A significant issue, achievement gaps. Um, we've increasingly become a world of haves and have-nots. And that, that plays itself out in higher education. Uh, in, the, in the state of Oregon, uh, we have a, an initiative called 404020. Um, and the 404020 initiative is that by the year 2025 in the state of Oregon, 40% of the citizens will have at least a, at least a bachelor's degree. 40% um, will have at least uh, an AA degree. And 20% um, will have at least a high school um, diploma or equivalent. So that puts a lot of stake 
on the educational system to do that. And one of the things that I reminded our commissioners um, at our last meeting about, um, I just finished chairing uh, the State Opportunity Grant Task Force to rework our state um, opportunity grant, which is the grant for the media students. Remind them that 404020 is an outcome initiative, not an access initiative. And there's a difference between saying we want 40% in education <laughs> and then let them survive and swim and see we make it. But we want 40% to get through four year degrees and 40% to get through two year school. And so the lot of the, our issue with the achievement gap is that our institutions have had these very bold access agenda. But we haven't really thought about the success agenda the achievement agenda. So how do we get people through the other side? And so, again, we're going to, we'll get to this a little bit later, but so what role do the residence hall, do the housing programs play in lessening that achievement gap and, and addressing those, those issues? Um, and I think one of the things you'll we'll find is that clearly within this issue around the achievement gap is um, our issues related to the cost of higher education. Um, and again, we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. But we know that there are still just gross inequities in terms of access and support that people receive in higher education. And again, these are the kinds of issues that are driving the public to ask questions because what we're finding is that the poorest students are leaving with the highest amount of debt. We're entering with the greatest needs and leaving with the greatest burden from, from their experiences, from their attendance. And we've got to do something about that. And I think that's an important conversation for for those of us assembled here this morning. Technologies. Um, you don't want me to talk about technology too long. <laughs> this, is not, this is not my forte. But I do know that um, technology has dramatically shifted um, the face of, of, of higher education. Whether it's the number of people who access higher education through um, through remote means, those who participate while even residential participate in education. So we find that, for example, we have students living in our residence halls, right, who are also taking our e-campus courses. <laughs> so they're so they're taking online courses while while living on campus. And so we know technologies has been becoming just a, a prominent feature of the educational experience. But it's also become a major communication modality for us in terms of how we connect. It's also a way means through which community um, can be both built and obliterated uh, because of the use of it. And so our challenge is how do we make sure that we're maximizing the educational value and educational benefit that technology can have for those of us um, who are working on campus and particularly those in the in, in the residential settings. Economic fluctuations in higher education, and I think this is probably the piece that, uh, of all of them, that's probably the biggest of the drivers. Um, because this is the one that I think that when we, when we came out of the recession, um, when we watched the impact on the education and the cost of education, this is the one that I think hit the public most. Because they started asking questions about why the cost of education was rising when the when the wherewithal of families um, was, was, was decreasing. Um, and so we know that public funding um, only in the rarest of cases is increasing, <laughs> um, but generally is decreasing and people are having to constantly be in these constant cut scenarios. Um, we've been in a situation where people have become to view education as a, a private um, benefit, not as a public good. And again, I think that's one of our real challenges is to be able to, be able to make a case of, so what is the social benefit of me having an education? And if I only use that in personal and selfish means, then absolutely it's only a private benefit. But if I use it in some way to benefit my community, our society, then it is. And so what role do we help students to play in helping students to transform and to translate their education into something 
that a requirement is to bring social value, not just to accrue personal benefits and personal goods. Um, and so one of the things that we know then is because of the lower levels of funding, it requires that we increase tuition and other costs of education. You know, when we look at some of our, our housing programs, you know, in some cases, you know, the word they use is self-support, which means, you know, that whole notion that every boat's on its own bottom. And so you have to sustain yourself through that. You know, it's only in a rare institutional situation that um, institutions wouldn't actually subsidize housing. Whereas, in fact, in most situations, even at the private schools where I was, housing was subsidizing other programs. And so the question is sort of how do we how do we deal with the economics of, of the campus and the pressure on us to bring down the cost of, of, of education. And so, you know, and I can share this now because I'm not an administrator anymore. Um, but uh, and, my, and my colleagues, and my colleagues, you know, it's really interesting, you know, when I became a faculty the first day I walked in the office, it's like I have freedom of speech <laughs> in ways that I never had before. Um, but you know, but one of the biggest struggles. Yeah, yeah, okay, I guess I'm lying. Huh? But anyway, so one, of the, but one of the challenges that I that I faced, and it was a real challenge, was the idea of whether our housing program should be in student affairs or in business affairs, and that struggle continues. So we worked out an agreement that well we will we'll have a joint report you know we'll be you know we'll do it both but they report to student affairs and they will consult with business affairs around the business income. But that was but that is a challenge because again the temptation will be and I think this is where the crux of the challenge is going to come the temptation will be to reduce housing to a business enterprise. And we have to be really careful not to play into that by only speaking the business enterprise language. And housing professionals need to figure out how to be multilingual, how to speak the education, the language of education, the language of development, the language of teaching, and the language of business. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all of those things. But if it skews in one direction, very soon is, it can be viewed as not contributing to the education mission and therefore being something that can be operated apart from the educational leadership of the institution, just as a place where we house or warehouse students as a necessary evil, as opposed to an incredible benefit and opportunity to add a dimension to the educational experience that would not be present were we not to have residential communities accessible. That is, that is, in my view, that is the challenge. Um, and I think that this, the hill on which refinement is going to become steeper as people begin to just commoditize education as a transactional relationship. How do we get rid of those things that are bothersome and increase those things? Um, and increase those things that are most necessary, which in some cases is courses related to degrees or courses related to careers. You know, years and years ago, authors and Kajetian and, um, and Bowie wrote a book called Intellectualism and Careerism in Higher Education and talked about this battle. This was you know, back, in the, um, back in the early 80s that they began to talk about that struggle. Well, I think that struggle is becoming very real and very powerful right now. And so the economics of, of, of issues are really important for us to think about. What we know is those of us who are state institutions is that the initiatives that come from our legislative body bodies really come with, uh, with the funding that are associated with it. And, and so as a result, what will happen is that they will have these mandates that will bring down the cost of education which the Oregon legislature has done many times. So we want to freeze tuition, or we want to freeze the cost of education, which in many cases is noble. 
But the ultimate impact on students is actually sometimes it increases the, the time to do. It actually increases the cost of education over time because of the short sightedness of it. Because what you do, you cut course sections, you cut out some of the really important supports that they need. And as a result, it increases the, the rigor of the student struggle to get through education. And then just the focus on decreasing um, student debt burden um, and time to completion will bring this increased scrutiny on cost of centers. And so one of the reasons, and I understand that they want housing to report um, that this is a fair other than what I think of some of the other candidates. That's the noble reason. But the, the, the most noble of the reasons um, is the idea that I think they really want to think about this all as part of the cost, controlling the cost of education. So if we can make sure we manage that, that's one thing. The other thing is that housing has reserves. <laughs> And the opportunity to get access to their reserves to subsidize other things in situations where they can't, such as LSU right now, can also be another part. And so while keeping down the cost may be, you know, noble on one side, there's also this other side. Of, it also is a, is a pretty vigorous, in some cases, revenue stream. And how do we do that? So again, those of us in housing figure out sort of what side of that conversation is really going on and what role we're playing now. And so when you think about sort of where we are, there is um, a really, really wonderful little article that was in Inside Higher Education called The, the Future of Higher Education that offered like, what they see as five potential models for higher education going forward. And, and all of those have, have import for, for housing. Um, first one is the, sort of the new pathways to a bachelor's degree, which is this sort of the most streamlined version that you can of of getting students to degrees, which is you start them in higher education, giving them higher education credit as early as possible. So these many places they have these sort of early college and these dual enrollment um, degrees. And again, I told you I'm a father of a senior. Well, my son started getting college credit for courses in his freshman year. Right? So he, he takes these courses and it's like, okay, you just need to put in your paperwork and that way you get your credit at the end of the community college for your son. Um, and then this fall, he started, because um, he maxed out on his language courses in high school. So he took college courses at OSU. Well, he's at a point now where he's not even going back to high school. This term he's finishing up, just by taking a couple of college courses at the university. Again, it's sort of the streamlined view. I mean, it's certainly not with my wishes that he's doing this, you know, but he's strong will and he's 18 and it's like, all right. Um, but it's that idea that if they're having an influence on young people, I think about so why stay in high school longer than you need to? Why don't you just sort of get on with your education? Well, again, what's happening is that we're finding that in some cases, like you can even look at um, the local school district here um, outside of Fort Dallas and Lebanon, where their students are staying a fifth year in high school in order to get college credit. And the school district then still gets their resources for keeping those students a fifth year. And then they end up getting their, they end up getting sort of basically their first year of community college completed while still in high school. So when they show up on campus, they're already significantly through their college experience. And so, and we know that we have students show up, whether it's getting AP credit or other kinds of things, who show up for college having gotten that early start. And so this is sort of that new pathways to the bachelor. How do you get people on that pathway to a bachelor's degree as early as possible and get them through it as efficiently as possible? And then there's the, the sort of the bare bones um, university, which is, you know, you minimize facilities, we streamline everything. And so, you know, one of the, the questions they ask in there is, do college, do we really need climbing balls? Or do we really need rec center? What does that have to do with education? Do students need to be participating in intramural sports? Again, if the goal is to get people in education and get a degree, why are we wasting time on these frivolous activities? And so there are some institutions that are actually being, as people are forming new institutions, they're forming these bare bones institutions. 
Yeah, I was at the University of Florida um, a year and a half ago um, doing a review, and they were going through an initiative there where essentially their governor was trying to figure out how to get people on $10,000 bachelor's degree. So how do you get through, the, through an undergraduate experience for $10,000? And they were going to begin to identify which of their institutions would offer that streamlined education. Well, again, that's the conversation that we're facing up against. And they were asked the question, you talk about bare bones. The question is, so what happens to us if bare bones becomes the main, the main of the game? Um, there are these experimental uh, models, which is sort of these, this low residency model, which is how do you have students spend the least amount of time on campus necessary and get them out in the field, get them out doing career-related things? so that it translates to, to a job. So how do we get people out into real world experiences? And we know that some schools have been doing things like this for years. So there's large schools like from Drexel University, Northeastern University, the University of Cincinnati have these massive co-op programs where students are on campus you know, for a year or a couple of terms and then they're off for a couple of terms. And what it does is it sort of obviously wreaks havoc with what their enrollment is. Um, but, it's this idea that you want to have people have a major experiential um, component to their education. Um, and we want, again, we want to minimize the amount of time that they actually have to spend on the campus. And then we've had seen a, a growth in a huge number of folks universities. So there's the Charles Schwab University, the Deloitte University, the Disney University, the Mobile Logan University. So we've got all these corporations, there's over 250 of them in the country right now. Corporations, they don't give degrees, but what they do is they give credentials. And they give what they think is sort of commensurate preparation for entree into their field. Um, and basically what they're saying is that the universities haven't done the job that we wanted them to do. So we're just going to take on doing our own preparation for our own workforce. And so corporate universities, um, and there has always been sort of this challenge within the university, within higher education, people are saying, we don't want to become a corporate university, right? Which means that have our agenda be driven by what the corporate world wants. Because again, the belief is that the world needs something more from higher education than just to prepare people for corporate life. And so the, the final one is the sort of the all of the above, um, which quite frankly, I think is our true problem is to figure out how do you balance, how do we balance all of those dynamic tensions and all of those social needs and concerns and create an educational model that really allows us to, to say, you know, there are ways that people can, can have sort of an economical experience in terms of getting through because you know, there's some people that education experience has an utilitarian thing. I need to get through because I need a job. And then and, and that is real. You know, and then there are other people who, for whom, quite frankly, education is a luxury. You know, that the, the world that, that the world is going to treat them okay, however they turn out, because of where they're positioned in the world. And then there's this huge mass of people for whom education is going to be another kind of opportunity system, and we got to make sure that they get the right kind of high touch experience and engagement with educational professionals that allows them to figure out what that future is going to be and what their calling can be. Um, and that's the group that I think will get lost and can really get lost if we just sort of go to this really simplified version of higher education. And so I think that our true calling is to figure out a way to, to fit within a world that allows all of those things. And so the opportunities for relevance that I think are, are present for, for those of us in, in higher education and, and for, particularly for housing. Um, is to think about as a housing program, as housing programs, how do we realize the promise of the mission? And I think it really means reading the mission statement of the institution and ask, and how do we add that? What is our direct contribution to this mission? Um, it's really important for us to, re to ensure that all students receive the educational benefits of attending college that are right in the world. And what we know is that some people get more benefit than others. And not every student gets all the benefits to which they are um, to which they are which they're deserving. Um, 
I think that we have to construct a very clear organizational ethos around who we are within the academy and what we're going to bring. We need to get that out and carry that out. Um, and then I think we have to really responsibly manage that which has been entrusted. And I think for some people, people they think what we've been entrusted with are the financial resources. And what I think what we've been entrusted with are the futures and the lives of young people, of those of us who come to education and the hopes that they bring with them to the educational experience. And again, how do we do that on the landscape right now where the conversation around higher education is so contentious? And the ways that I think we do that is we've got to elevate our contributions to learning. And so I want to quickly just go through some of the things that I think are really important for us to, to think about. Um, first of all, I think it's really important for us to consider how we use our knowledge, energy, influence, and our relationship capital. I think there's a tremendous amount of relationship capital um, that we have um, on our campuses, um, but we've got to figure out how to tap into that. And again, I hope we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, I think it's important for us to provide leadership that emphasizes the importance of student success and community health and well-being. Um, And I think that it's really important for us to think about sort of the kind of experiences that we provide to students, faculty, and staff. Um, because again, we know that through our housing programs and through our dining programs, we do more than just serve students. That we actually serve the campus and we actually can pay, play a significant role in the overall health and well being of our campus and our campus communities. Um, and we need to think about how we contribute to that, that higher level functioning. Um, we've got to engage in powerful partnerships um, and we've got to create those, those learning enhancing relationships and so the, the powerful partnerships that i'm talking about is so how do we find partners who are committed to creativity and to elevating the educational value and benefit of residents and the ways that we do it, I think, is to, land, to scan the landscape for people who are doing things that we think could have relevance to residence hall, rather than figuring out what we want to do in the residence hall and going outside of science and how we can do that. We got to tap into faculty's energy and agendas and show them how we can bring life to those who are connecting them with our residence hall experience, rather than going out and convincing people to come into our spaces. I think the power shifts are much more powerful when they build on existing energy that the faculty member has. And we've got to scan the landscape for where those partnership opportunities are and find ways that we can, we can connect and we can bring people in. I think we have to shift our focus from training to teaching to learning. And part of that is I think by focusing that, um, we build possibilities for more collaboration and the content of our conversation shifts. So if we know that the language of exchange on campus is learning, then let's make sure that people know that, that we're engaged in that enterprise. I know we spend a lot of time in talking about you know, training programs. I think shift in nomenclature can have a powerful impact on how people view the work that we do. And so I would, as a staff, begin to think about how do we shift to the language of currency of higher education, which is, around, which is an emphasis on learning. And in order to do that, I think we have to ourselves function as learning organizations. Um, so we need to acquire that common language with, with faculty members. And then really adopt the nomenclature for, to accurately reflect what our contributions to the learning In this case, we want to consider you know, an emphasis on um, training and programming and reframe those dynamics as teaching, development, education, and curriculum delivery. Um, you know, we have to call what we do what it is. And again, I think that, that programming is one thing, but if you think about sort of the body of programming people together, it is a residence hall curriculum. And I think that we sort of sometimes shy away from that because we don't want to say we don't want to have that get confused with the formal curriculum, but it is our formal curriculum. 
And we don't have to say it's you know, an alternative curriculum. It is the rest of the small curriculum. And so I think it's important to, to, to name what it is. I think it's important for us to, um, to audit the physical spaces um, for which we have responsibility and identify what type of learning is happening where, as well as sort of what are the messages that are embedded in those environments. Erica Sinbrecker led an initiative just many years ago for us to actually do audits of our environments. You have people go in and say, when you walk into the space, what is the message that people get from those environments? And what the signal does that send to people about the activity that we want to inspire in those spaces? And so we need to think about how do we create more inspiring spaces by making sure that the environments send the messages that we want. Um, Again, how do we use our residence halls for integrated transformative learning? Again, maximize the promise of those environments as, as teaching and learning laboratories. Again, this is sort of going back to the old language from Brooks to another who talked many years ago about gaining management and about residence halls as a learning venue. And how do we make sure that we actually have those with our residence halls be um, learning laboratories? And then I would be remiss if I didn't say we have to commit to ongoing assessments, um, both to measure and to report our contributions, the contributions of our efforts in relationship to, to, to student learning. And so there are a few principles that I think are really important for us to, to hold on to in this, this, this crazy conversation. One is that um, the residence hall community must be viewed as an integrated social system. That in some ways we have to be quasi sociologists. We have to understand how groups operate. We understand how norms feel, um, how norms form, how values play out, and what happens when you get groups of people interacting amongst themselves in a high density um, situation. Um, the community goals that we have must have positive value for the community members and the institution. So again, we need to think about sort of how do we constantly use two frames? How do we make sure we shape communities that are valued to students, but also how do we ensure that the communities that we form also hold up the values of the institution, our organizations, our youth colleges and our universities? Um, and then the characteristic of the community has to reflect the characteristics of the members and our institutional ethos. So oftentimes we will again we'll focus on we really want to sort of students to form their communities around their value. But we also have to say how do we make sure we embed our institutional ethos in the formation of those communities so that they also have that external guiding value that they hold on to as they you know, as they grow. So some of the contributions that I think we can we need to make or, or, or can make um, have to do with creating some unique student-centered approaches. Um, and so how do we, understanding the wide range of roles that students have in their lives when they come, and the wide range of goals that they bring with them for their educational experience, how do you craft living learning environments that honor all of those things? <coughs> so I don't know what the, you know, sort of the, the work patterns are of some students in this hall, but I know that there will be some students who will be living in residence halls, who are not working, um, who their primary focus is on success at school. Whereas there are other students who are working 20, 30 hours a week, they're scrambling, they're struggling. And so the amount of discretionary time they have for engagement in the residence hall experience will be different. So how do you construct living learning environments that acknowledges that you may have people at those polar extremes in terms of why they're there. Also, students who come to the college or university experience with different life experiences that says that the needs that they have in the residential experience may be very, may be very different from others. So when I went to college way back then, and you know, I was the only African American student on my on my residence hall floor. <clears throat> so the, my need for sort of psychological safety <laughs> and to feel at home 
in this small rural community when I had grown up in the inner city environment were very different. And so again, how do we sort of acknowledge just the various needs, the, the range of needs that people bring in the construction of the, of the rural environment? Um, we need to provide an orientation to the campus values, norms, and expectations. And again, we need to help our campuses to understand the value of us doing that. Because again, we provide the orientation to what it means to be engaged in the community as college. Um, we need to play a role in shaping students' perspectives on campus, local, and global citizenship. Again, using citizenship as its own state, but what does it really mean to be a citizen of the world? And they have responsibilities for contributing to, to your to your local um, your local community. Um, that we need to create a foundation for relationship development, and then particularly that the the nation the notion of how do I help people to connect with relate to to value their experiences with people who are different than themselves, and so this engagement with diversity and cultural and intercultural skills. Is an important component of that. If you look at it, unfortunately, if you talk to many faculty members in the classroom, they're not seeing this as, as their responsibility. And when you look at the place where our institutions are receiving press around the condition on campus and particularly the intercultural dynamics on campus, the residence halls are one of the places where we can say, here's a place where we can make that. We play a role in doing the things that the rest of the academy has not quite figured out yet. And so I think the concerted effort there is one of the places where we can really um, make, make a difference. And so finally, the thing I think is really important for us is to assert ownership for the future. That one of the ways to be relevant is to own the direction of your life, rather than to turn that direction over someone else. And so I think it's really important for us to both lead um, and manage our housing programs, which means to lead people um, and cultures and to manage resources. And I think our ability to help people to understand those two dimensions of a housing program's responsibility is really important that we are the leaders of these powerful educational communities. But we also have this awesome responsibility of managing these massive enterprises, particularly those places that have a really large program. We've got these massive financial enterprises that we're managing. But we're doing that while also constructing vibrant educational communities that advance the mission of our institutions. Relevance like that can't be outsourced. You outsource somebody who's just giving a service. Somebody who's just constructing, who's just managing a transaction. And we've got to help people understand in this confusion around what is the business of higher education, that housing is not just a transaction. That it, is a, that it is a vital educational um, experience in their life. I think we need to, um, to build on the, the dominant themes in the national dialogue into our organizational conversation and plan. So we need to, in our regular ongoing conversations, have conversations about quality, equity, partnership, pathways, workforce issues, and quality. Again, we we engage in helping people, again, I haven't worked with many RAs over the years. In fact, I didn't know if I had a conversation I had. I got an email from a student, former student, um, last year. And um, he said, he started off and he said, I um, was talking to a friend of mine and telling her about an impact that you had on me. And she told me I need to write you and tell you. And he says, remember when you threatened to fire me? <laughs> so this is an RA that I had back, literally back in 1971. And, and he was, um, he had gone to a prep school, and so he was just, you know, so he, was, he had this sort of, this, this persona where he just sort of sit around, this was just sort of smoking, he was just sort of sit around smoking his pipe, just sort of reading for leisure, but he was like not getting grades. 
And I said, if you don't get your grades up, I'm not going to hire you. And he, so then he said, well, you know, yeah, I really took that seriously, and you probably want to know when I come back to the university for the graduate, but I graduated with honors, and then I went on and did you know, my MBA at Harvard, and so I'm now a, a partner in this company that's big consulting firm in New York City, which I had heard of, but, but my spouse, who used to work for a, a consulting firm, said, this guy's a millionaire in the meantime, so <laughs> he's a partner in this kind of thing. And he said, but he said, but just that wake up call, and he says, I just hope that. He said, I'm sending my daughter off to Columbia in the fall, and I hope that there's an educator there who will take her seriously enough to be honest with her in those moments when she needs it. Well, that's the kind of thing that you all do when you work with artists. When you have a chance to sit with a student in a conduct session, that there is some powerful education, there's some powerful shifts and in insight that you can provide the students with. That's like it's really important for us to do that and then to quantify the way that our educational agenda and that curriculum is played out in the lives of students. I think it's really important to construct and articulate a vision that you want others to support and then to build support. So take your vision for the future to others rather than let other people sit back and figure out the vision that they have for you and sort of you know, impose it on you. That's about owning your future. That I'm taking my vision to the people who I want to support it rather than letting somebody else figure out who I should be and have me take it to me and, and then me argue with about whether that's a worthy vision that they need to pursue or not. And then finally, it's really important to make this more than just a, an individual campus issue, that we have to really make this an association issue. That I think groups like the Crew Hall, um, which was my first professional association, <laughs> needs to think about how we make the relevance of housing programs, the issue on the agenda, and ensuring the long-term success and viability of, of those programs. Um, so I want to wish you well on your journey. Um, I really would hope that you would um, find ways to enter this conversation, because I think this is a crucial conversation for all of us, and particularly crucial for our students. Thank you very much.